You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing the rights of the great apes with Colin Goldner, the coordinator of the Great Ape Project. We'll also talk about two women in Morocco who are facing trial for gross public indecency for wearing a skirt through the market. We'll also refer to the case of a young Kurdish Iraqi man who is facing trial for criticizing Islam. Uh, we'll be also talking about a man who's spent his recent life rescuing women from Islamic State. And also we'll, we'll be answering one of our viewers' questions. Our insane fatwa will be on uh, how women was waxing their private parts is undoing the good work of God. And we'll also talk about Ramadan and brothels. You don't want to miss this program. Stay with us. Great apes, including chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas and orangutans, are our closest living relatives. They're intelligent, can reason, are self-aware and share a range of human emotions. They have a similar lifespan to humans and form strong family bonds which they maintain for life. According to Richard Dawkins, we admit that we are like apes, but we seldom realize that we are apes. The Great Ape Project advocates a UN declaration of the rights of great apes that would confer on them basic legal rights. When we discuss the question of rights for great apes, we often hear people saying that, you know, you can't equate animals with humans and also that there's so many terrible things happening to humans let's hold off and not worry about that for now but I really think the two are so intertwined we are animals after all and the better we treat other species um, and species very close to us like great apes who are one of us um, the better we all will be yeah the definition of man or the, you know the values of man man being defined in opposition to uh, animals in most recent modern times really you have the beast, the wild, you know, the savage, and then you have man, uh, who's supposed to be the, the ultimate sort of living creature of, uh, that exists on Earth. This definition is problematic, I think, uh, because it, it just it objectifies uh, uh, the animal sort of kingdom effectively. F and, uh, and very negative. Uh, absolutely, very, very negative. And that sort of, we need to change that. And I think one of the things too, the more I think about it, is that in a sense we, we need to do that just because we are all so complicit in the mistreatment of animals, you know, in, in what we eat, in how we dress, and in how, you know, going and visiting the zoo. I mean, a lot of the ways we look at animals is very, is objectified and, and, and sees them as a lesser sort of species than us. And therefore our consumption and leisure and and uh, enjoyment. Yeah, and to desensitize you know, human being and human society from animal kingdom, you objectify them, you turn them into a machine, you turn them into something that we don't feel anything. Even, even you know, the, the movies, that the relationship that we built. And I think that needs to change. For us to be able to define ourselves again, a complete human being, complete living creatures, we need to incorporate animal and animal rights into a definition of human beings and I think that's important. Definitely. Now let's go and listen to an interview I did earlier with Colin Goldner. I found his talk fascinating and I really think it just gives a, a really another very human point of view to great apes in particular and why they really need to have the same legal rights, uh, very, very many basic legal rights from the right not to be tortured, the right not to be imprisoned and the right to life and liberty and so on as human beings do. Stay with us. Welcome, Colin Goldner, to our program. I wanted to ask you about your project, trying to get legal rights for great apes. Can you explain that, please? Yes. Uh, great apes, we're talking about uh, gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees, and bonobos, who, at this uh, current situation, just have the legal status of objects that can be owned or possessed or traded or virtually used the way their owners like. They also can be mistreated, they can be abused, um, 
for instance, uh, used uh, on display in zoos or for entertainment uh, purposes in circuses. They can also be abused for biomedical research. They can be hunted for, for, bush uh, for bushmeat and so forth. And we are asking to grant them legal rights on the ground of their close genetic similarity to humans. Basically, great apes are just humans with a bit more fur, a bit more hair on the body, but they do have the same uh, intellectual cognitive capacities, the same uh, emotional capacities and abilities, the same uh, communication techniques and, and capacities, uh, just on a bit more retarded level. So uh, they are virtually just like we are ourselves. So it is absolutely uh, moral, morally to be discarded, to withhold those legal rights from them. In your talk, you talked about how they need to have the right to life, to liberty, not to be tortured. Yes. Explain those fundamental rights that they deserve and why. Yeah. So uh, we are asking uh, to grant them legal rights, which is which actually are three legal rights, basic rights only the right uh, to, uh, to live, the right to individual liberty, and the right to be free from torture, which means um, they are, to, uh, are entitled uh, for, um, for physical and emotional intactness, for inviolability of um, physical and mental health. So uh, those are basic rights every human being is entitled, and why should we stop uh, with our own species and withhold those rights from our closest relatives in the so-called animal kingdom. It's just morally wrong to withhold those rights from them. Can you explain more on how, I mean, for some people it might seem strange, how, how can animals have more rights than humans? Can you explain more on why it's such a necessity, especially when it comes to great apes? Because there is no uh, reasonable ground to withhold those rights from them. This is the, the very basic uh, argument. They are entitled uh, to the rights every human being enjoys by uh, to withhold those rights from them. And if anyone argues they just are not entitled to have those rights, he or she should um, argue for this position. So we argue uh, if, we, uh, if we give those rights to every human being, every human being enjoys the right of inviolability of um, physical and mental health, of individual freedom. Um, why not the great apes? What's the difference um, they have? What do they have we don't have and vice versa? Traditionally we have a distinction between humans on one side and all animals on the other side. Um, the great apes, they are just on the very uh, top of the so-called animal kingdom. So they are so close to us that if we open the door to them then the door will be open to all the other animals as well. And if we fence them off, if they are on the other side, all the, anim all the, the other animals are on the other side with them. So uh, if, it, uh, if we could have a chance to make this, this uh, borderline permeable, this would be of benefit not just for the great apes, but for all the other animals being used and abused in uh, horrific, horrific conditions, uh, in circus, in the zoos, but also in the industrial mass production of meat. It would be of benefit for all of them. You talked about how human beings don't necessarily want to be seen to have the same rights as apes because some will say it diminishes uh, the human being's standards, yeah. stance, status. That's, that's uh, so many people regard it as uh, downgrading man if we would grant um, great apes or any other animal similar rights or parts of the rights every human being enjoys. Uh, and it's true, if we grant those rights to non-human animals, um, then man, humans, would definitely lose their position as summit of creation. They think to be entitled uh, to, because religions of all kind um, make men, make humans think they are the summit of creation, being created in God's own image, so to speak. And they would even regard it as blasphemy if we would grant the great apes 
uh, some rights so far only humans enjoy. They would say, well, uh, if we give uh, great apes um, rights that would uplift them to the position of humans, and men, at least in um, Christian belief systems, think they are created in the image of God. I don't know if this is true in, in Islam belief system as well, but I assume it is. Um, and if we give the apes now similar rights as humans, then in turn we would argue that maybe even God the creator would have the face of a gorilla or of an orangutan. And this is regarded to be blasphemy. To me it's not, to me it's the contrary. I'm, uh, I think it's, it's very uplifting to me to, to think I'm part of the evolutionary process, linking myself um, with, with all the other um, animals and all the other creation uh, in this world. And if at all, if at all uh, a god uh, created me in his image, then I wouldn't mind at all if, if this god would have the, the wonderfully gentle face of a gorilla mother or of an orangutan mother. I think there's no motherly, more motherly creature in this whole world than an uh, orangutan mother with a, with a small baby. I would feel very comforted and safe if uh, my divine mother or my creator would be uh, would, would have the face of an orangutan. Uh, you talk about zoos uh, yeah. being like cages where uh, you know um, um, the, the great apes are detained, yeah. you know, uh, under human custody. Do you think people shouldn't go to zoos then? And if not, what other ways can they learn to love animals, really? Well, uh, it's always said that uh, zoos contribute towards a kind of education. The children go there and they learn to um, uh, they, they learn a kind of love and respect for, for animals. They encounter exotic animals they wouldn't see otherwise. But if they go to the zoo, the very contrary is happening. What they see in the zoo behind iron bars and armor glass windows is not the wild animals they think they encounter, but they only see tragedies. They see uh, parodies or, uh, or, or cynically uh, in case, um, imprisoned animals who are just a, a carbon copy, a bad carbon copy of their wild uh, conspecifics. You see uh, polar bears pacing up and down constantly or elephants uh, weaving their, their trunks back and forwards uh, or, uh, or, or tigers or, or leopards moving up and down behind their, their iron bars or um, uh, great apes eating their, their own fingers or, um, or pulling off their hair or masturbating constantly uh, means showing behavior they would never show in the wild. So caged animals in the zoos are in most instances psychologically uh, very sick. They have to be treated constantly with a psychopharmacological uh, um, drugs, they have to, to receive Valium uh, so, or um, benzodiazepines or neuroleptics uh, to stand the condition in the zoos without dying or without killing each other. So uh, a zoo is, is a madhouse. Zoo drives animals crazy. Plus they lose all the capacities and abilities to survive in the, in the wild. You cannot uh, retransfer them to a natural habitat. They stay in the zoo for a lifetime um, on life sentence. They haven't committed any crime and they are committed to uh, a judge to, to a life sentence. So a zoo is a horrific place and it's not a place uh, children learn anything about the animals uh, and they don't learn respect for the animals. On the contrary. So if you go to a zoo nowadays, the children uh, go there and they bang against uh, the windows and they make fun of the animals. They throw stuff on the, on the animals. Um, they, they throw the chewing gum in and, and, they are, and they think it's very funny if the animal then uh, stamps on the chewing gum and, and so forth. So it's, it's just a horrific place. Children do not learn um, love and respect for the animal, but the contrary. If I want to teach children uh, love and respect for nature or for animals, then why not go in the forest? and teach them or show them uh, the wonderful um, nature we have in our surrounding. So if you go to a zoo and you look at exotic animals coming from far away from Southeast Asia, coming from Africa, 
uh, in our regions the climate is not okay for those animals. It's either too, too warm for polar bears, for instance, or way too cold for animals coming from the rainforest belts. So they have to stay indoors in very, very tight and cramped concrete cages where they lose everything that makes up uh, their life. So they're depressed, they're sick, they're... It's, it's just wrong, it's morally wrong to imprison wild animals. Thank you. Okay. Two young women hairdressers on their way to work, going through an open marketplace in Morocco, were surrounded by Bazaris, merchants, uh, who were angry, shouting at them for being grossly indecent. Uh, and uh, the police, when they finally came, rather than helping the women and arresting those who were threatening them, actually arrested the women. And they could face um, up to a few years in prison as a result. This is another shocking news, the same as the Egyptian sort of dancer who produced a, a video um, with a dancing partner and now she's been in prison for a year just because the, the uh, video is you know, thought by the state uh, to be uh, immoral. And that's the thing. And, and the states, rather than supporting and protecting the right of individual to dress, they intervene in support of the reactionary and usually religious and Islamist groups in, in North Africa. Yeah, I mean, we, we're often seeing that when the state intervenes rather than defending the victims, people who are being harassed, intimidated, they side with the Islamists and the reactionaries and people who are misogynist. Uh, what, what's interesting, though, is that for there's been lots of protests against this, and you know, 25,000 people have signed a petition. I'm sure it's a lot more now. And people are saying that there's nothing, it's not a crime wearing a dress. And also, um, there have been protests in various cities. So there has been a pushback, but there are uh, groups saying that this has never happened, especially in that area in Morocco, Agadir. It's unprecedented there. And I think it shows, you know, a, a sort of wave of Islamization that is fighting back against people's demands for freer dress and but movement. The fact, but the fact that it's demonstration and protest, and people are not accepting that. That's that, that's that's why it's shocking what's happened. At the same time, it gives hope to a lot of people that you know people are um, protesting and and they're not allowing this to become the norm. The right to dress is important, right? Yeah, and I think that's important for all of you. You know, all of you people who are so worried about the right to hijab think about actually for a vast majority of women, it's not about the right to hijab, but it's, hijab is imposed. It's not a right for many people, for most people. And, you know, it's important to show our solidarity with people in Morocco as well. Pastor John Piper of uh, DesiringGod.com, he's come out and said that women waxing their private parts are interfering with God's great works. And I mean, if this is God's work, isn't he also supposedly one of God's work? That is a big failure, massive failure. And also why, you know, the focus on women's private parts, sexuality, the hair, <laughs> What's got to do with them? I don't understand. You know, what's this sort of, the God's design, God's dis decision? How does he know? He's got a private line He's with got a God. Line it's, to it's God. It's called I mean, delusion and loony, uh, looniness, but yeah. No, I think, I, I think <laughs> the thing is, you know, and the, the crazy part is that, you know, what about the rest of what people go through their life? Like, don't cut your hair, that's God's well, he's, design. Well, he's cleanly shaven. Yes. But it's interesting how they always sort of focus right there where yes. it hurts, yes. you know, yes. <laughs> for them. Yes, and the nose and the tooth, you're not, you're not supposed shaved, to brush, you're not supposed to brush your hair. teeth, brush is God's design. What about the hair in your ears? So you pluck them. I, let's not go there. <laughs> so, I think the best thing you can do is to go to his website, desiringgod.com. What are you doing, Mary? I'm sending people to, get, to Yeah, and ask, ask Pastor John. There's a section, ask Pastor John. Ask him all about your waxing needs. It's important. He can help you because he's got a direct line with God.
Yusuf Muhammad Ali is a young man who studied Islam and Sharia law for, for many years, even though his family weren't religious. And then he decided that he didn't believe anymore. And he went to school and talked in school about the Big Bang Theory. And as a result, he was threatened by Islamists. And when he went to the police to ask for help, what do you think they did? Again, they, they, most probably they arrested him. They arrested than people, him. Yeah. This, is, this, this is it. And he's in, he, he was taken to jail in December. He's, he's waiting his court hearing in... Uh, On the 13th in, of in, July. In, in July. And uh, they are charging him in Iraqi Kurdistan, which is self-governed part of the Iraqi government, self-governed region. They want to try, put him on trial for blasphemy. And criticizing Islam. Islam. And yeah. that, this is a horrible thing that yeah. is happening. And we need to make sure that he is supported. And he's written to us and he said he's a secularist and he wants to be supported by everybody who believes in freedom of expression. Yeah, so what we'll do is we will post details on our Facebook page as well as at the bottom of the screen. So do write letters uh, and ask for his immediate and unconditional release and for the cancellation of his trial. The picture of this week is of a mother holding a sign that says, Where is my Saeed? And it is about her son who has been missing for 16 years, Saeed Zain Ali, who was, went missing during the 18 tier protests in Iran, which is the 9th of July 1999, all those years after the attack of the Iranian regime on students and many were killed, thrown off of buildings. It was a bloodbath and many arrested as well and disappeared. And uh, evidence is there how brutally they crushed the students and the student movement 16 years ago. Still people are suffering from those. It's not the case that people were on trial and it's finished. It's, it's, the, 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 actually a lot of people have gone missing. A lot of young people have been killed and parents do not know what's happened to them. And this picture it just gives the, you know, the, the pain of a mother who has been waiting uh, for her son and to find out what's happened. And, uh, and the Islamic regime in Iran needs to be held accountable for, for this and to be answerable to at least to the mother of this, mm. this young man. Yeah, definitely. I mean, where is, where is Said? That's what we all want to know. Saeed al Dahi is a lawyer who has interviewed every family in Sinjar and he's found that 3,000 women and girls had been abducted by ISIS and um, it's the biggest abduction ever taken place in contemporary history of women and girls and he has rescued over 500 of them. And such a, such a good news that yeah. somebody who's worked tirelessly for month and month and gone knocked on every single door identified and listed every woman who in St. Jar was abducted by this and she's he's compiled and now he's, he's got a project to rescue them 500 of those women and young girls been executed uh, been rescued and this is a great news for that region that there are the network of people trying to rescue and support women in, 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 in Iraq and Syria. Is, yeah, is, is and, and he talks about how it's basically he's got a whole network of people in the Islamic State, which is an area bigger than Britain, where there are so many people who are helping at great risk to their lives. Three of the men who've helped him rescue women have been executed by the Islamic State. So it's a great risk, but what a wonderful thing uh, that is taking place. And we'll show you some pictures. Um, we'll show the viewers some pictures of, you know, a girl being um, embraced by her mother after being rescued. I think there's nothing more wonderful than that. And what great hero he is really for all of us. Absolutely. And he says anybody who wants to go to, uh, you know, supposedly go and uh, work for Islam, he says, come and speak to these women and hear the realities of life and all of you will change your mind. And the other thing is that he's continuing his work and we need to support this type of work. Definitely. I mean, I think we should all know this person's name, this, this man's name, uh, Saeed um, al Dahi. We'll, we'll show a photo of him on the screen. Really, he is one of our heroes. And he talks about the situation of women there where they have to wear three face veils and even an eyeball showing is a prosecutable offense. So good news indeed.
Now we've got a Ramadan special because we are in Ramadan. It's the period of celebration for all of us who defy Ramadan's rules. Now, what's very interesting is that uh, in Vienna, uh, we've heard that a manager of a brothel has said that when the Iran talks come to town, they do great business. And it's uh, and we know where that business comes from. Definitely. These are hypocrites they in are. power in Iran. They bend all the rules for themselves and have one rule for everybody else to, to control people and one rule for themselves to enjoy all the riches of life that, from, from their point of view. And they're arresting people for defying fasting rules in Iran, and imprisoning they've been caught them, eating as well. and they're eating as, while they're in Vienna. Well, that's okay, they should, everybody should be eating, they should, they should give up the hypocrisy and remove the rules of Ramadan, compulsory Ramadan on everybody in Iran as well. So, you know, um, at least someone is, uh, you know, taking enjoyment from the Iran talks and it is the uh, managers of brothels in Vienna. The question this week is from one of our viewers who calls himself Komole Socialisti on Facebook. He asks how we can challenge sexual relations and equality of men and women um, uh, and uh, challenge the traditional and religious viewpoints on it. Yeah, historically religious and, and traditional view, which are very main, mingled together and very mixed, they've had an influence on the sexual relation and particularly sexuality of uh, women. It's, it has a history, but there are different layers of that needs to be challenged. So you have an issue of the power base of that, you have the institution, you have the ingrained cultural issues that they exist uh, and the relation and people absorb all of that and reproduce all of that. But the institutions are uh, Im important and we've had that experience before. Yeah. It's not the first time. And also, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of it has to do with people's protests, whether it's individuals and, and, you know, how they try to push boundaries to live their lives, but also in protest and social movements, the women's rights movement, for example, the, the movement for um, sexual liberation, the movement of nude protests, protests, for example, all of these are linked in helping to challenge the, the status quo. And there are moments in every society that, that it's sort of focused and zoomed and society looks at these things and they need to be organized, in an organized fashion, people need to question those, both challenge individuals, power relations and also the cultural issues and it constantly needs to be questioned. Definitely. Now we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program as much as we enjoy bringing it to you. Don't forget to send us any comments, any questions you have and we'll be sure to respond to them. And also if you have an issue or theme that you would like us to address. Yes, from both of us up to, uh, till next week. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are an alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. 
Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.